Uh, Brother Mustafa Ahmed, can you um, unmute your mic, please? Oh, can you hear? Can you speak? Just we just want to test out like the mic. Oh yeah, definitely. So um, can you guys hear me well? Yeah. Um, we're gonna start like in a few minutes, I think. Um, oh no, no problem. The waiting list. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. No. No worries. No worries. Assalamualaikum guys, we'll be starting in a bit. We'll just wait for more people to join in, inshallah. Also, quick reminder: if you're um, if you're just waiting till the event starts, uh, just it'd be good if you guys could fill up the form that's in the chat. Um, it's only for UNSW students, so that way it allows us to hold events like this in the future as well. It's an app requirement, so thank you. Also, if you've done it before last week, we still have to do it again. Like it's a, uh, because we're having new events every week. So that's what I say.
All right, everyone. Um, just just a um, new we we started this new thing where basically we're going to be doing like a um intervals every every a few minutes or so, like probably twenty five minutes or whatever Mr. Farmer thinks appropriate. So that way you guys have more of a um, chance to engage with the talk inshallah with these Q and A's we'll be doing. So three Q and A's whenever, um, after any section or whatever. So I guess people are joining, alhamdulillah. So Brother Mustafa, if you want, you can start now, if you want. Yeah, inshallah, jazakallah khair. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, ya Rabbil Alamin. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. Inshallah, we'll begin and commence today's uh, da'wah discussion uh, we, we we left off from last week uh, so alhamdulillah we spoke about the importance and significance of da'wah and why it's uh, it's such an important duty upon all of the muslims you know it's a responsibility that cannot be ignored you know it's particularly when we're living in the west such as australia when we're surrounded by a majority of a non-muslim population um, and you're also faced with you know, a lot of shubuhat, which is literally doubts, uh, a lot of mistaken ideas and assumptions regarding Islam, uh, confusion about Islam, and also misrepresentation of Islam. So given we're living in such a context, da'wah even becomes more crucial and essential, particularly for the self-preservation of Islam. So that we can preserve the Islamic truth in its Islamic identity, and so also we can defend it, and we can dispel the doubts that arise, uh, that is confront that is confronted to us from the atheists or from the other religions or either from the atheists. So, we spoke about da'wah and why we as Muslims we should partake and contribute into this mission, which is a prophetic mission that was commanded and instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to propagate the deen of Allah. And there are two essential pillars when it comes to tabligh, when it comes to the propagation and the conveyance of Islam. The first is to speak about Allah, to convey to the people about the reality of Allah. And the second is about Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad ibn Abdullah alayhi salatu wa sallam, the final Khatim al Nubuwa, the final Prophet, the seal of Prophets, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These, with these two, they are the fountainhead of Islam and it is the establishment for the truth of Islam. So we speak about Allah, you know, and we also speak about the Risala wa Nubuwa the the messengership of rasulullah and how it is our duty as muslims that for us to follow and for us to emulate the sunnah the prophetic teachings of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so this is the call of da'wah um, and we also spoke about how we should approach da'wah what is the methodology uh, and it is about the concept of islam that the reason or rather the fundamental reason for why we pray uh, for why the muslim uh, the muslimah the muslim woman wears the headscarf and observes the other commandments or the other instructions relating to to in, to the clothing and to the dress code um, and all of the other rulings in the ahkam uh, such as why why the muslim praise five times a day and why we fast during the month of Ramadan and why we should stay away from riba which is usury or interest and why we refrain from alcohol etc okay so all of this was based on the concept which is we do so out of our submission to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay and there's also a methodological reasoning as in there's a logic and a rationale behind this as well. Now, I did not mention this last week, um, but I'll mention it now. And the rationale and the logic behind our istislam, istislam, which means submission and surrender to the will of Allah, 
in other words to the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that we know for a fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our creator okay so this is uh, in premise form okay they yet they are yet to be proven but it is in premise form in a logical sequence in a syllogism which is just an argument a logical uh, structure of an argument so we know allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our creator number two allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alim which is that he is all knowing he is all knowing which also means that he knows what is right and he knows what is wrong and as in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is the best outcome the best course of action for humanity allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what will be most conducive to the flourishing of the human population into the human race what is the most beneficial for the for for, for the human race and for mankind also allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-hakim al-hakim which basically means that allah is uh, uh, possesses wisdom okay allah is all wise he possesses wisdom we also know for a fact that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kareem and that he, he is rahim he is merciful and that he is generous kareem and he's rahim and he's merciful when you put these facts and these premises together you come to the conclusion that the best thing to do is to submit to allah because he knows everything and he has wisdom in everything and he has created us so he knows us more than anyone else can know us he knows what's best for us what is good for us what is most beneficial to us what is wholesome to us and he also created us out of his mercy and generosity and love so the rulings and the ahkam and the commandments and the prohibitions or the instructions of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are actually for our benefit and anyone who denies or um does not accept the conclusion is mistaken and is only following their hawa hmm? is only following their hawa which is their uh, their own ego and their own uh, passions and desires and their whims uh, and therefore just following their own self okay but when you put the above premises together and the facts together is the only logical conclusion would be to surrender to submit to allah and that is the best thing to do because if you follow yourself you are not all-knowing you do not have wisdom you are not all powerful and you you do not know what's right and what's wrong and you do not have that eternal timeless knowledge factor whether this action and also another point to mention is that the ahkam of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they do not pertain to singularities they do not pertain only to the particular rather they are aam they are general and therefore the general population therefore humanity the commands of allah are for humanity so you have to look at the wisdom the insight huh? and the benefits and the good outcomes the consequences at a human scale a mass human scale only if you do this and only when you do this then you will know that the ahkam of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they are the best okay now, i will not dwell on this for too much but that is the whole logic of the gorap so what the gorap essentially what it aims to do what it attempts to do is to prove so that we can come to that conclusion which is submission and surrender to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay so we will continue from where we left off from last week and i believe it was on this slide okay so we were also speaking about 
some of the philosophies that are out there. And they are also instilling shubuhat, which is doubt and confusion amongst the people. That they propose an idea of scientism and empiricism. Empiricism is the idea, the concept that um, they believe that uh, the only true observations can be made of nature or empirical things which are sensible. This is called hissi, huh? based on the senses. And observation of these hissi things, these physical tangible things, can gain or can lead us to knowledge. It is from these things in which we can have and acquire knowledge. There's another similar, and it's a related concept, although not the same, which is called scientism. And this is also a philosophical belief that the scientific method is the only way of knowing things. Everything other than science is meaningless and it is nonsense. And the proponents, the supporters and advocates of this philosophy, they are also called the logical positivists. If anyone has studied the history of the philosophy of science, you will know that they were called the logical positivists. They are also called the verificationists. Huh? The verificationists. And they are the empiricists. Um, so, I mean, these are related concepts, but they are very limited in its scope. Okay. Now, both of these philosophical ideas that are presented on the screen, empiricism and scientism, these are, according to its own philosophy, it is incorrect. Why do I say this? Because the, the statement itself, which is mentioned here, about empiricism and about scientism, these statements themselves cannot be proven empirically or scientifically, respectively, if that makes sense. So these two statements themselves, they are unwarranted and unjustifiable. So there's no, I mean, there is no need to accept these two philosophical ideas. Also, coming back to the point of science, what exactly is science? It's very important as, um, as uh, particularly, I mean, as Muslims who are on campus, um, because there are a lot of scientific influences, a lot of science mentioned, you know, you know in, in your lectures, a lot of science mentioned in your university courses, what science is and science, you know, uh, is the only way, it's the best way, it is the truth, it is the most factual, it is the most objective way. So it's presented in a very nice way uh, that will influence people that, you know, science is the way. So we have to first understand what is science. Now, science is about, you know, hypo, uh, hypo, uh, hypothesizing predictions, so coming up with predictions, uh, doing experiments, making observations, and then noting the results obtained and evaluating it against the null hypothesis. It's a very basic definition of science or the methodology of science. For example, the painting and the painter. Using science in the instruments and tools of science, we can determine the physical properties of the painting Mona Lisa. Okay, just based on a scientific uh, empirical observation. However, science cannot tell us anything about the painter of the painting. Can science tell us whether this painting was painted or not? This question must be answered. This question, it must be answered. Whenever you give da'wah to anyone or speak, whenever you give a da'wah, when you speak to anyone about science, mention this point to them. Look, science can tell us certain facts or certain, uh, certain things, but it cannot tell us about the author or the originator 
of that thing which we are inquiring about. For example, the painting in the painter. Science can tell us based on our observations of, of the painting, but it cannot infer or conclude that there was a paint of the painting. Now, does this mean because science cannot find that there is a painter for the painting, that it means that the painter does not exist? Again, this is a very this is a very critical question that must be answered. Second, does this that's what we were speaking about, that this mean that there was no reason behind the painting of Mona Lisa. The first is about there being the presence of a painter, and the second is about the purpose and intention and the reasoning behind the painting. Science can never tell us that there was a reason, an intention, or a purpose behind the existence of anything. Science cannot tell us. Again, the scientific method starts with an aim, hypothesis, prediction, method, results, and conclusion. Now we speak about the assumptions of science. In any discussion of science, you must mention the assumptions of science. That science is science based on its assumptions. So you cannot take away science as being, uh, you know, this neutral free. It's a neutral. It is an objective method. No. Science itself is predicated on axioms on assumptions that must be taken for granted without any evidence for them, without any scientific experiment for them. It is just taken based on assumption. The first, we'll go through each one of these so that you know the assumptions of science. The first, the existence of extra mental objects. This in philosophy, it is called realism. It is called realism. Science assumes realism, that the universe and the world around us exists, that this object in front of me, the laptop, it exists. It exists beyond and outside of my mind. This is called realism. Science also assumes naturalism. What is naturalism? It is a dogmatic belief hmm, in the philosophy of science. It is the belief that only the natural world exists, which is again, the physical tangible things matter. And everything can be explained by naturalistic explanation. In other words, every effect that takes place in this natural phenomenon, in this natural world is based, or it can be reduced to natural causes natural causes. This is the assumption of science. This is the premise in which science starts any investigation, any inquiry into the world. It assumes the only natural world exists. And for whatever effect that I see, there must be a naturalistic explanation of cause. Okay. The third assumption or axiom, which is the law of identity. Something is what it is, in other words. Okay, the law of non-contradiction. That something uh, cannot to be uh, uh, its opposite at the same time, at the same place, and in the same relationship. So, for example, um, this object, which is in front of me, it is a glass. Okay, there's a glass in front of me. This object, it cannot move and it cannot stay still stationary at the same time in the same place so the same object same time same place and in the same relationship this itself it is a fallacy and it is an impossibility and number three is excluded middle okay all of these terms are related in the excluded middle is a conclusion you get based on the law of identity and the law of non-contradiction number four which is the law of causality. Hmm? The law of causality. What is causality? That an effect arises from a cause. Any effect. Any effect. See, when you say effect, it necessarily means it is a contingent thing. An effect is a contingent thing. 
an effect is based on a cause. This is causality. Science starts off any scientific observation or inquiry into the world based on the law of causality. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. This is based on causality of the water being boiled uh, uh, by heat. So when heat is applied and the temperature reaches 100 degrees Celsius, you have evaporation. You have evaporation. So the water themselves, it converts, it changes from being a liquid into gas. Okay, this is the boiling point of water. This is based on causality. Number five, that future events resembles past experiences. This is an assumption that there is a regularity in the world. That if I were to observe water boiling 100 degrees Celsius, it will boil 100 degrees Celsius tomorrow and in the future. If I see the sun rising from the east, tomorrow it will rise from the east. If fire burns, it will burn tomorrow. This is the principle. It is also called the uniformity of nature, that, the, that nature itself is regular and it is uniform, it is consistent. There is consistency in, the, in nature, in what we observe. Number seven, fixed patterns of natural behaviors. This is also the same thing. Number eight, the reliability of our sense perception in processing observations. Science assumes that our sense abilities, such as our seeing and our hearing and our touching and our smelling and our tasting, all of these are reliable inf information processing. So reliable. Number nine, the reliability of our mind to make inferences. We see an observation, then we make an inference. We make a conclusion. This making inference, this mental inference, this mental conclusion process that we do, science assumes that it is a reliable conclusion. It is a reliable inference. This is based on, on the assumption of the mind, that the mind is a reliable tool. Okay. Scientific conclusions. The conclusions derived from individual scientific experiments are at best inductive and provisional. Very important with the possibility of being falsified. Any conclusion from science, any, any conclusion from science, they are at best inductive and provisional with the possibility of being falsified. Everything in science, which is called a scientific conclusion, you know, after you do an experiment, there's always a conclusion the conclusion that you derive, it is always open to the possibility of being contradicted and falsified by new evidence, by new data, future data. Okay, now what is induction? We said that the scientific conclusion are based on induction. Induction, it is a process of generalizing from the particular experiment, from the particular observation. You make a generalized conclusion, for example, the classical example, I have seen 100 black swans. Huh? Swans. All swans are black. This is the induced step. They call it the induced step. You make your observation 100 black swans, you make the inferred, generalized conclusion that all of the swans are black. This is inductive, it is provisional with the possibility of being falsified. Scientific explanations. Scientific observations and explanations can be understood or interpreted in a variety of ways, or in varied ways, and in different ways. This is called the principle of underdetermination of evidence. This is very important. Underdetermination of evidence suggests that all evidence necessarily underdetermines under any scientific theory. Why? Why is this the case? This is the case because any scientific theory or any scientific explanation it is always open to at least more than one interpretation it is open to more than one interpretation there is at least one rival or competing theory with the same evidence 
the same evidence. For example, when it, when it comes to the cosmology or the origin of the universe, based on science, there is at least more than 15 competing theories about the origin of the universe based on the same data. This is called underdetermination of evidence. So you have evidence, but it is open to so many different ways of understanding, interpreting, and coming to terms. This is called, again, underdetermination of evidence. It is open to multiple interpretations. You do not have a categorical, objective, singular, absolute way of coming to term or to come to understanding of the evidence. Now we move on to the limitation of science. Science only deals with nature and matter, which is directly observable. And basically, the, the whole, uh, I mean, the whole uh, slide, the slide is depicting and it is telling you of the limitations of science. There are many limitations of science just because of time. I'm not going to go through all of them. But I've mentioned some of the key ones so far. OK, we've covered some of the key ones so far. Um, but I'll just let it up there for a few minutes. Or well, not, not for a few minutes, maybe for 10 seconds for yourself to read. But basically, science has numerous and multiple limitations. OK. Mm. And this is more uh, limitations of science. So I'll just leave it up there for a few seconds for all of the participants to read the slide and to understand and to internalize and comprehend the limitations of science. Okay, clarification. We are not saying, and nor are we promoting, that science is inherently problematic, useless, or it's redundant, or it should be abandoned. If anyone has this understanding from what I've said, then I'm clarifying that this is not the intention. Rather, we believe and we affirm that science works, and science is useful, and science has its time and its place and science can give us benefit. Okay, science has provided a number of benefits to civilizations, into humanity, into society. We accept this. All we are saying is that place science in its correct place. We have a philosophical exaggeration of science. People think science is the be all or end all. Science is the only way. Anything other than science is, is irrational. This is what they say. Anything other than science is irrational. We say you have exaggerated the position of science. All we are doing is we're placing science back to its place. It has limitations, accept it. Science is not the only way. Okay, so far, does anyone have any questions? I will stop here. If anyone has any questions, you can ask. By the way, guys, um, sorry, feel free to use your mics if you want to speak. That's us there. Okay. We have a question by Zainab. She says, relating to underdetermination, which that all, which that all evidence necessarily undermine or un underdetermines any scientific theory, does an agreement of the scientific community at large increase the value of a partic particular theory? Yes, this is correct. If the consensus or the agreement of the scientific community with respect to a with respect to a scientific uh, inquiry or a scientific theory, it does increase 
its uh, its acceptance, it does increase its validity and its uh, its virtue or the value, if you like. So that is correct, yes. But again, uh, as in, although in principle what you say is correct, um, there are very few, very few scientific theories that have this capacity or that have this, uh, or that meet this criteria to such an extent that the large and the vast scientific community agrees or that there is a consensus upon a scientific theory. So although in principle it is correct that it will be uh, almost, um, uh, it will, its epistemic value and its acceptance will be higher and greater, but at the same time, um, it, it's very limited to the number or to the amount of scientific theories that you will come across that can meet this criteria. The majority of scientific theories are disputed amongst scientists themselves. They're disputed, there's a dis disagreement. Even when it comes to evolution, there are over 17 different standard accepted scientific theories just on evolution, over 17. And again, we are not talking about the, uh, the what do you call it, the fringe, like the fringe group. Now, this is not based on the fringe group. We're talking about professors, PhD, it's in peer-reviewed articles and journals uh, with a following, with a following, with evidence. Over 17 different interpretations and understanding of evolution. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? If not, I will continue because there's a lot of slides to, to go through. But if I do see a question, I will answer. Okay, I will answer. With that being said, now we will resume. Okay, now we move on to the rational thought. So we spoke about the scientific thought and its usefulness and limitations. Now we speak about the rational thought. For example, a scenario. Someone knocks on your door a few times. Is it rational to say, uh, sorry, is it rational to say that someone, a person has knocked on your door? Hmm? So for example, and then your friend tells you, Oh, no, nah. you know what? Um, it just happened on its own. Don't worry about it. It just happened on its own. It's, you know, the sound or the knocking on the door, it happened on its own. Don't worry about it. Would you consider his opinion rational or irrational? This, again, this scenario must be reflected upon. We have a good gauge from our personal experience and from our intuition, intuitive understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted and has bestowed upon us to determine what is rational and what is irrational. If someone were to tell you this, you would automatically say that your opinion, it is irrational. We know that knocking on the door does not happen by itself. The door cannot knock on itself. Rather, there must have been someone who knocked on the door or there must have been a ball who hit the door. There's a ball or there was something or someone knocked on the door. But to say, oh, look, it just happened by itself. Again, this is a very irrational position. Okay. The rational thought process. Now we speak about the process of how rational thought works. Rational thought is built on four essential components. Number one, reality. In order for rational thought to work, rational thought Again, we're not speaking about rational logical axioms. Rather, we're speaking about rational thinking, or rational thought, which is the process of developing or coming to an inference or a conclusion. This is based on the, the assumption, or it is based on the, on the existence of reality, that there must be reality. Okay. Number two, sense or observation sense or observation there must be a sense or a, a sensory processing and observation uh, that must be made number three which is the mind or the intellect now this is the tool itself it is the mind or the intellect this is the faculty 
from which you can make a deductions or inductions or abductions or other analogical inferences. It is the mind, it is the uh, intellect, which is the reason, the faculty of reason. And number four, previous information. This is also a component and it plays a function. Also, there's another noteworthy point that I've mentioned here. Causality is not derived from experience. Anyone who tells you causality is derived in the basis of causality is experience is mistaken. Causality, it is inherent to the process of thinking itself. Causality is not one of the components of rational thought. Rather, it is so inherent and so fundamental and such a necessary uh, tool to the whole thinking process that it, it's basically what occurs from one point to the other, such as you have reality. Okay. Because there is reality, you have sense perception or you have sense observation. There is already an association of causality in play. And then you have the mind or the intellect, which again, it is working, it's functioning based on an observation. This is based on causality. Because of observation, the mind makes an inference. Then you have previous information to guide the inference. All of this is based on, as in the process itself is based on causality. One thing leading to the other. Okay. Any questions before we move on to the next topic? If there isn't, I'll move on to the next topic. But I'll give time so that if you guys have any questions of whatever I've said so far, please ask. Okay, we have a question, Ahmed. Um, that can you please expand on how causality distinguishes one reality from another? Yes. So, for example, you can, uh, I mean, this can be known through scientific experiment. You subject water to heat. So, you apply heat to water and you want to determine its boiling point. Okay, so you apply heat, subject it to heat, you determine to determine its boiling point. You do the same thing to another liquid, to another liquid, um, let's say, um, to juice or to um, copper liquid or any other liquid. You apply heat, so you subject it to heat to determine its boiling point. Uh, causality, the functional causality here is that based on the outcome, based on the outcome, the effect, you can determine the identity or the reality of one thing from the other. Water boils 100 degrees, another liquid boils at 70 degrees Celsius at temperature. This tells you, based on the, on the, on the usage of causality being at play here, one thing, water, is different to another thing. This is on the basis of causality, because you manipulated a variable called independent variable. Based on this manipulation, you have come to know the effect of one thing from the other. I hope that answers the question. No worries, you're welcome. Okay, so we'll move on. Uh, but at the same time, if there are any other questions, I will answer them. Okay, so I have the, the chat box on my right hand of the screen. So if there is anything, I will definitely, uh, I mean, I will answer them. So now we'll move on to God. Just as an overview, um, like a, a brief overview or synopsis. Okay. What are your thoughts on occasionalism? I, I, I never mentioned occasionalism. I, I, I did not say anything about occasionalism. Um, I mean, that, that is a bit of a sidetrack, but if I have time, I'll answer it. This was made by Brother Hamza. If I have time, I'll answer it. But for now, I just want to stick to the topic. Jazakallah khairan. I, inshallah, we'll get to that if we have time. If you have any other questions that is relevant to the topic, please, inshallah, you can ask.
Okay, so we have Najifa Rahman. Uh, she mentions, how would you go about proving, uh, sorry, how would you go about proving the causality is inherent to thought or thinking to an atheist? You would still be referring to physical experiences to support that claim when you're giving da'wah right. Of course, of course. So, for example, you will, you will tell him that you are responding, for example, say you are responding to my claims or to my conversation that I have to you, um, if the person is, is an atheist, and say that the reason why you're responding um, is because I'm speaking to you. I mean, this is causality. The reason why you're thinking in the way you're thinking and producing the responses that you are producing, it is based on what I have said to you. So something has invoke, invoked or something has induced, caused um, you to say such a thing or act in a certain way. Um, the reason that you have come here is because you, you came from class, so you just had a class or, or, or a, um, a lecture or something, and now you're walking to go home. I mean, everything in a person's life is based on cause and effect. So, I mean, no one can deny causality. And also, when it comes to the thinking process, to be more specific, um, we, see an, we see an event, we see a, a phenomenon, and based on this phenomenon, we tell ourselves, okay, well then, based on subjecting this variable, okay, which is the independent variable, we come to the effect, the specific effect, based on the manipulation of one single variable. Again, this must be based on causality and observation. And then you have the, the causality of thinking itself. So now, you come up with an inferred conclusion based on your experiment, based on your observation. Okay, for example, oh, okay, so water boils at 100 degrees because this is what it says here. Um, as in, that's just one example. Um, but there are many other examples from which um, thinking, um, thinking itself is, um, how, how can I say, it is driven, yeah, if I can use the word driven by causality. Yeah. No worries, what yak, inshallah. Okay, so we will, again, if there are any questions, you can ask. So the Islamic concept of God is the following. Number one, the wujud of Allah, the existence of Allah. Number two, the, the eternality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence, which means Allah has no beginning and Allah has no end. His existence is eternal and it is absolute. His existence itself does not compose of individual discrete time. Number three, he is self-subsistent and independent. In other words, the existence of Allah is wajib, it is necessary, and it is not muhdath, which means it is not contingent or dependent on anything else. Allah exists through himself, which is called Qiyamu bi nafsihi ta'ala. And this is very important. That is the self-subsistence or the self-existence of Allah. The next, um, the next point is his transcendency. The transcendency of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he is immaterial, he is non-physical, and he is spaceless, and that he is timeless. Why? Because the creation is material, physical, within space and within time. So it is impossible for Allah to be like the creation. And the proof will come. So the proofs of all of this will come. Then he's one in singular. So inshallah, this is just the overview. Now we will go through each one. The first argument that I'll be using is the Kalam cosmological argument. This argument attempts to prove the existence of Allah. That's it. It attempts to prove the quality of existence, that Allah is mawjood, that he is existent. Okay. It is also called the argument from causation in the first cause argument. In the formal argument, number one, 
whatever begins to exist has a cause for its beginning. Number two, the universe began to exist. Number three, therefore the universe has a cause for its beginning. Number four, an infinite regress of created causes is absurd. And number fifth, which is the conclusion, therefore an uncreated cause of first cause must exist. Some of the terms may be technical, but we'll go through them one by one, inshallah. Premise number one. Whatever begins to exist has a cause for its beginning. In this premise, in this principle, it is a logical principle. Anyone who rejects or denies this principle, in fact, is rejecting logic. Whatever begins to exist, whatever begins, begins, it emerges into existence, must have a cause for its beginning. It's impossible. Again, please keep this in your mind. It is not a matter of, of possibility or, or, or a matter of probability. Rather, it is impossible and absurd for anything to begin and to emerge as an effect into existence without any cause. Again, this is based on the principle that preponderance without a preponderant is impossible. Again, it is simply not possible for something to begin to exist due to nothing or without cause. If something begins to exist, it must require something to make it exist. Otherwise, it should not exist. The default is non-existence. Again, keep that in your mind. The default is non-existence. The question must be asked, why did it move from non-existence into existence? What took it from non-existence into existence? This, this question must be answered. Causation, therefore, is necessary for any beginning. The universe is of no exception. Usually, when you speak with the atheist, or what you see in debates with a, a theist and an atheist, they will come up with this understanding that the universe is an exception. They will say, I agree with you that anything within the universe is uh, uh, this rule applies, is applicable to this rule. But the universe itself is not applicable. We say that this person has committed the fallacy of special pleading. Why do you make the universe the, ex the exception? There is no justification, no explanation to make the universe the exception. Rather, the premise is general. Whatever begins to exist has a cause for its beginning. It does not say whatever in the universe begins to exist has a cause for its beginning. So again, this point must be clarified. And then you have other objections made by physicists and some of the ignorant atheists who have no idea about quantum mechanics. And they will tell you that, look, the universe was as a result of nothing. I'm literally, like literally, I'm saying this verbatim from what they say. And they will tell you the universe came and is a result of nothing. So we tell them, okay, what do you mean by nothing? And they will say, physics has found the answer. Physics has found the answer. Physics tells us that based on quantum field fluctuations, this can cause things to emerge into existence. Okay, so hold on. Previously, you said nothing caused the universe. And now you're saying quantum field fluctuations can cause things to pop into existence. So yeah, that they have contradicted themselves. This is what you call a self-contradiction fallacy. That first, they define nothing. Uh, and at first, they say nothing, but they redefine nothing as something else. They have redefined nothing as being something. This is what you call a linguistical fallacy. Okay. Yeah. Linguistic gymnastics. Professor Loris Krauss, he uses the word nothing in his book, but implies something in his book. So he claims it to be nothing. The title of his book is The Universe from Nothing. Within his book, he explains nothing as something. And the something he speaks about is of the quantum field, uh, where you have the quantum subatomic particles. 
and they emerge or pop into existence based on, on the energy of a high volatile energy in fluctuations. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, this is something. This is something. I do not know of anyone who would call this nothing. This is not what we mean by nothing. This is something. Okay. Rather, it is the, in, the philosophical nothing that we are speaking about, the philosophical nothing that we are speaking about, okay, which is based on this quote, if there is anything we find inconceivable and impossible, it is that something could arise from nothing. And again, we are speaking about and in the language, the linguistical definition of nothing. We're not speaking about quantum mechanics of quantum vacuum. Premise number two, the universe began to exist. The second premise is true based on both philosophical and scientific arguments that the universe has begun to exist. From a scientific standpoint, the mainstream and standard, the widely uh, standard opinion and view in physics, in, in astrophysics and in cosmology is that the universe had a beginning. In addition to this, our, our current scientific data go against the steady, the steady state model, which is the unchanging model about the universe. It is the static state theory or the eternal theory of the universe, that the universe is eternal, that the universe is eternal. It is without a cause or that it is without a beginning. It is without a beginning. So science is agreed upon this point. Science cannot and run away from this fact, science cannot escape, and an atheist cannot escape from this point that the universe has a beginning. There was an initial starting point to the universe. Now you will see the explanation that they, that they will try to come up with. They will say it is based on string theory. It is based on M theory. It is based on some other kind of uh, quantum mechanic theory. So they will substitute Allah, God, the creator, the originator, for one of these flawed theories. And indeed, they are flawed. And they are flawed for multiple reasons. As in, uh, just on each one of them, we can spend a whole discussion on it. On each one of these theories, we can spend a whole discussion discussing why this theory is flawed and it cannot be used as a... Um, as an explanation for the cause of the universe. Whatever the, yani this is the qaida. I will tell you the principle how to refute, how to refute anyone, any objection that is a substitute for Allah. You tell them, you are either falling into three fallacies. The first is the fallacy of self-determination. And I think this is coming up. Yani, Wallahu a'lam, but I'm sure this is coming up on the slides. The principle of self-determination which is that something can cause itself. This is a fallacy. Number two, the principle of circular reasoning, which is that the universe was caused by itself. And different from the principle of self-determination, but it means the universe was as a result of another universe, which was a result of another universe, which was a result of another universe. They also... Other alternative ways to explain this is the oscillating or the vacillating theory of the universe based on the bring on the uh, the big crunch you have the contraction and the expansion contraction expansion of the universe which again which is flawed because of this uh, fallacy of circular reasoning it is called daur and daur and then you have another fallacy which is called tasalsul tasalsul this is the absurdity or the fallacy of, of an infinite regress, an infinite regression. So any objection that an atheist makes, whether they are an academic physicist or not, they will fall into one of these three categories. Know them well. We will move on. There are a multitude of philosophical proofs of premise number two for the beginning of the universe. The universe, for example, the universe can either be eternal or temporal. The universe cannot be eternal. There are three decisive, definitive qat'iyun, the philosophical proofs for the absurdity of the eternality of the universe. Therefore, the universe is temporal. It has a beginning. 
Okay. Premise number three. An infinite regress, which again, it is called tasalsul. An infinite regress of created causes is absurd. Okay. The explanation of this is, for example, the universe, it came from, uh, let's say, that there was an alien. An alien has caused the universe. Then we ask, is this alien eternal or is it temporal? In other words, is the alien itself created or uncreated? You will say it is created. Otherwise, you would accept that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is created. But you say that why, why is Allah uncreated? So, so now we are demonstrating the fallacy of your thought. Let's take it reducto ad absurdum, which is one of the philosophical ways of discursive discussion anyways. So then we explain to them, okay, this alien, it is created. It was created by another alien. Is that also created? You would have to say yes. That was created by another alien, which was also created. And that alien was also created by another alien, which was also created. And this results in what is called the infinite regress fallacy, that no effect, nothing in the effect comes into existence. If you want, you can read what I've mentioned in, in the slide. Uh, it's probably more clear in the slide. So inshallah, if you want to take the time to read what I have on the slide, uh, I mean, that, that could be of use and benefit. I'll leave it there for a few seconds. Okay. Okay. So I've also explained it. There you go. I've also explained it here. The fallacy of infinite regression. If universe, we start from here. I'm not sure if you can see the mouse. We start from universe one, which is our universe. Our universe. It was as a result of universe two, which was as a result of universe three, which was as a result of universe four. If we keep going forever in an endless infinite regress, endless infinite regress at the Salasun, then what you have is that nothing would in fact exist. Someone has asked the question, is the distinction between the principle of circular reasoning and infinite regression? But the principle of circular reasoning acknowledges that there was an initial cause, no. Both of them are fallacious because they denied an initial cause. The only distinction between these two fallacies is that a circular reasoning, it is, for example, A was caused by B, B was caused by C, and C was caused by A. And there is no initial cause. There is no initial cause. It just keeps going in a repetitive, in a repetitive circular, uh, circular, uh, circular, um, circular causation. Infinite regression, it, it is when there's an uh, when there's a regress, um, and 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 infinitum an infinite regress so for example as you can see on the screen here universe one was caused by universe two which was caused by universe three was caused by universe four you keep going with no initial cause no initial there's nothing to start there's nothing to initiate and it is because of this reason it is a fallacy because if you do not have an initiator an initial cause or a first cause then nothing will and then there will be no effect in the most simple terms nothing would exist there would be no effect at all because you're still searching for the effect for example if i snipe i mean i think from uh, number two so if you, if you were to look at the second point if a sniper had to shoot the enemy but before he could shoot the enemy he had to ask permission from the sniper behind him and this went on forever would he ever shoot there is meant to be a T, they should. Obviously not. Why? Because the permission has not ended. As in, you still seek permission. So the permission will not be granted. So which means that the person will not be able to shoot. Okay? So, uh, which is, this is an analogy, if you apply to the universe, nothing would ever exist. Nothing would exist. 
but the fact that we do have existence is the decisive proof. The fact that we have existence is a decisive proof that there must be an initiator, a first cause, which means necessarily that it itself is uncaused and uncreated. In other words, it is eternal. It is eternal. This is the only way, this is the only way that you can have the answer of existence. What you yet, any time. Okay. The conclusion, and therefore an uncreated cause, the first cause must exist. And again, you can always tell the atheist, explain to the atheist that God is not based on a guess, nor is it based on assumption, and nor is it based on a myth, and nor is it based on an imagination. We have rationally inferred the existence of an uncaused cause. This we call Allah, or this is cause, we, we name and we label and we call God. You can call it whatever you want, the title does not matter. We do not disagree with name and label and title. The concept is what matters, that there must be an uncaused cause. If they admit this, if they accept this, then technically speaking, they have accepted God. Okay, yes, this is the principle of the fallacy of self-determination, which is called self-creation or self-causation. Can the universe create itself? The answer is no. Why can't the universe create itself? Because it must be in the state of existence and non-existence at the same time. This is impossible. It is impossible, absurd. I hope this point is clear. Then you have the argument from contingency. This is another argument, but we do not have time. So I'm going to have to skip this. Sorry, but I'm going to have to skip this. Does anyone have any questions? Please ask. Please ask if you have any question. If we had time, we could have gone through the argument from contingency, but we don't have time. By the way, keep in mind everything that I mentioned, everything literally from beginning to end, Everything that I have mentioned is written in the books of Islamic theology. Everything that I've said is mentioned in the books of Islamic theology. Obviously, I have made it more contemporary. I have made it more contemporary by, for example, speaking about quantum mechanics and whatnot. But in terms of the qawaid, in the principle, in the arguments, it is all laid down by our own Islamic scholars. Yeah, we are talking about 700 years ago, 800 years ago. Yes. Honestly, it's very amazing. It was mentioned 800 years ago, 900 years ago. All of the arguments that I'm mentioning. Yeah. yeah so anyone who says that, um, uh, you know, that Islam is a backward, you know, Islam is irrational, is honestly deeply mistaken. They have no idea how deep and how academic and how scholastic Islam is. All they need to do is to study Islam. Yes, that is correct. Yes, that is correct, Najifa. Uh, Muhammad Hijab, he uses the argument of contingency. But I mean, that's not the only argument he uses, um, but that is definitely one of the arguments that he does use, the argument from contingency. And you should also know that there are seven different arguments of contingency. <laughs> like, I don't want to complement, uh, complicate the matter. Uh, basically, they all have the underlying principles, which is being contingent, which is being contingent. But there are seven different variations or formulations of the argument of contingency. The argument of contingency, it goes back a long time ago, long time ago, even at the time of, um, of the Greek philosophers. It was then taken and inherited by some of the Muslim philosophers, such as Ibn Sina. Ibn Sina, he did take the argument from contingency, but it was modified. So there are modifications and variations of the argument from contingency. 
the argument that I have presented here, yeah, uh, yeah. So um, I mean, the argument that I, I have presented here, it is taken from the book of Asanusiya, the book of Sanusiya by Muhammad uh, Ibn Yusuf as Sanusi Al Ashari, rahimahullah. So I mean, this argument is taken from his work. You can find it. What was the argument against the universe being eternal before scientific theories? Interesting question. Very important question. And the one who addressed this was by none other than Imam Al Ghazali, rahimahullah. Imam Muhammad, Imam Muhammad Al Ghazali, rahimahullah, Hujjat al Islam, who passed away in 505 Hijri. He addressed these points because prior to this, they believed that the universe was eternal, co eternal with Allah. The only difference was that the universe was contingent and that Allah was, was a necessary being. But they believed in the co-eternality of these two things. Imam al-Ghazali he refuted by saying that the universe cannot be eternal. Because if you say the universe is eternal, then it would entail that the past history of the universe is eternal. Now if the past history of the universe is eternal, you cannot have any new additions. If the past history is eternal, you cannot have any new time, any new events, any new moments, any new life, any new existence. You cannot have any new addition into the past history of the universe. But he said factually and by reality we see that there are continuously, we see new moments are coming into existence, a new time. Uh, with, you know, and there are new events. New events are emerging. If new events are emerging, it means that the sequence itself must be temporal. It cannot be eternal. Because you cannot add to the eternal. It is absurd. So this is just one of the philosophical ways of, of answering this question. If I've confused anyone, please tell me and I'll clarify. But we have a lot to get through. We have a lot to get through. So I'm just going to have to move on. Okay, we have to move on as we speak about the nature of this creator. So far we have so far we have only come to the conclusion that there must be a first cause but they will tell you how do we know that this first cause is the Allah in the scripture the Allah that you speak about and the Allah that you worship hmm? we say this is a good question it is a valid question it's valid so we will answer it the way how we answer this is how do we know that this cause creator and necessary preponderator or determiner is God Allah? There must be a number of necessary, necessary. So they are called sifatul wujub, necessary attributes that this being, the Creator, must have, must possess in order to create. Very important. In order for creation to be possible, it must have certain qualities. Okay. So we have already established it must be eternal. After eternal, we speak about transcendency. It must be transcendent. What does transcendency mean? Number one, it is called ba'in min khalqi. Number one, ba'in min khalqi. That it is distinct and it is separate from the creation. In other words, the creator is not conjoined and it is not part of the creation. Point number one of transcendency. What is how do you translate transcendency into theological terms, Islamic theological terms? We call it mukhalafa lil hawadith. Mukhalafa lil hawadith. Opposition to the contingent created things. Okay, that's point number one. Point number two, it is distinct and indifferent to the creation. In other words, the, the reality of Allah is different to the reality of the creation. The reality of the creation is a substance, a physical composite. It's called murakkab, murakkab, a composite substance that is made by a jawhar and the arad. You have the jawhar and the arad based on a sub uh, substratum, and it has many attributes or many properties. Anything and everything in this dunya, in this world, in this cone, is a physical material thing. Physical material thing. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the creator of all of this, he must be dissimilar. 
unlike the contingent, material, physical, tangible, space-bound and time-bound phenomena. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must be different. Why? This is the proof. If anyone wants the proof, this is the proof. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was like the creation in being material, a composite, a physical, time-bound, space-bound thing, then it would mean Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is limited, dependent, and contingent, and therefore created. So you go back to the point of infinite regress. That what it means for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be an uncreated being, the necessary being, he must be transcendent. It is a necessary consequence of his nature. I hope this point is clear. Okay. The creator, he must possess knowledge and intelligence. Why? Because creation would not be possible, creation would not be possible without knowledge. Okay, what do I mean? Without knowledge of what you create and how you create. These two things are essential for any manufacturing, for any generation, for any uh, production of creation. Knowledge of what you make and how you make it. If it is, you know, if you say, if you say, that um, we as human beings, fallible human beings, when we create something, when stuff will not create anything, but when we make something, manufacture, produce something, we do it with uh, knowing what we're making and how we are making, such as we are making a phone, we know what we are making, the phone, i.e., and also the how we are going to make the phone, how we are going to manufacture and produce and engineer the phone or the car, or the plane, or the house, or anything. Is it not therefore more befitting for the creator of the universe to know what he made and how he made it, or what he created and how he created? This is a very logical point. A very logical point. We have a question by, by Brother Hamza. If we accept that the creator always existed, why does it follow that he will always have life a very interesting question. This will be answered. This will be answered. I will answer this question, inshallah. And the next property is will, which is called irada. Irada. Huh? Or ikhtiyar. The iradiya and the ikhtiyariya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of the cause. That creation, creation, it was a willful in a volitional act. What is the proof? I will give the proof of this. If the universe or if the creation was not based on a will and it was not based on a choice, then the universe should not have existed. Simply put, the universe should not have existed because the default is non existent at Adam. Adam. Adam al wujud. Adam al wujud is non existence. Adam al wujud. The default of the universe is that it did not exist. And the question is if the creator did not have a will and a choice, then it would not be able to take it from out of non existence into existence. As in, it is not possible to create or to make something because you do not have a will, you do not have a choice. You cannot select and choose. Does this point make sense? And there would be no effect. For example, I'll, I'll simplify this. If I want to drink water, mm -hmm, but I do not have a will, I do not have the property, the attribute, the quality, the faculty of will. I do not have the capacity to choose. Will I ever be able to drink the water? The answer is no. The answer is no. Likewise, if the creator did not have a will or a volition, it would not be able to create power and ability. This is called qudra. The qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mutlaqiyya. This is absolute. What is the proof that, that the creator must have power and must have ability? Hmm? If the creator did not have a power or ability, then it would be unable to create. It would be unable to create. 
Why? Because power it is a prerequisite for creation. You need to have some ability to make something to create. You know, creation is bringing everything from non-existence into existence. In order for this to happen, it must have power. Okay? This is a very logical point. Now we come to Brother Hamza's uh, his comment, his question about life in living. The theologians have said that life is the outcome of the previous attributes. In other words, if something has knowledge and it has will and irada, the faculty of choosing, and if it has power and ability, then it must have life. This is a very important point. Life is not life is not the same as will, knowledge, or power. It is a separate attribute. It is a distinct sifa, an attribute distinct, but it is the consequence. I hope this makes sense. Logically, I mean, we're speaking about logically. Obviously, there is no ontological priority when it comes to the sifat of Allah. There is no before or after or a sequence when it comes to the sifat of Allah, which one came first or, or which one came second, no. They were always there eternally. We are just speaking about, for, about it from a logical reasoning point of view. Also, life makes one able and can act willfully. If you do not have will or the ability and knowledge, you do not have life. But if you have life, then it means you have the capacity, you have the ability, and you have a will, and you have the capacity of knowledge. Hmm. Now we speak about the sifa of wahdaniya, the sifa of wahdaniya, or the sifa of ahadiya, which is the oneness and the uniqueness and the singularity of Allah, the Creator. Since the Creator exists non spatially and immaterially, it must therefore be indivisible and absolutely one. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a composite. What would be an example? As in, there is no example. Uh, as in, there is no example. Um, uh, so, I mean, uh, what I was trying to say here is can you think of an example of something that has life but does not have will, power, or knowledge? Or that has will, power, knowledge, but does not have life? But can it be logically deduced? That the creator will always live. Of course, the, the logical argument here is that the being itself is a necessary being, and the being itself is eternal. What this then means is that the attributes of this being must be eternal. Why? Because you cannot have the contradiction of eternality and contingency. For example, saying that Allah is eternal but his qualities themselves are contingent and created or they are uh, they're time bound such as that they will come to an end or that he will die and this is what you call impossibility and there's an inconsistency here you cannot conjoin eternality with temporality if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is affirmed to be eternal it therefore must mean his 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 self attributes these are what you call self attributes they are qualitative attributes of Allah, affirmative attributes of Allah. They also must be eternal, without end, hence why he is ever living. Ever living, which means eternal in his life, and eternal in his will, eternal in his power, and eternal in his knowledge, and eternal in all of the other attributes. You cannot say that the attributes themselves are created. That's impossible. Wa iyyakum, inshaAllah. Now we'll speak about this. Mm -hmm. The argument uh, from exclusion. Okay, so to best demonstrate this point, let's say that there are two creator. Right now, let's consider the scenario that there being two creators. One creator wills one thing, and the other does not will uh, the existence of that thing. So, for example, one of the creators wants to create. Uh, wants to create. Uh, let's say an animal, an animal, 
The other creator does not want to create that animal. It has to be the same animal. Hmm? One creator wants to create, the other one does not want to create. Three possibilities. First, they both cancel each other out. The will cancels each other out. There's a clash of will, which means the negation of the divinity of both of them. Neither, neither of them are divine, or neither of them is divine. Okay. Second, one of the will overpowers the other. One, the creator of one of the will, it dominates and over prevails, over dominates the will of the other. It eliminates the other, which means this overriding will is the supreme will, which means this is the creator. And this is the, and the, ilahi, the ilahi will, the mutlaq will, the absolute and divine will. Mm -hmm. Or both wills are always in agreement with one another, such that the will agrees with one another. There is uh, agreement and there is harmony between the will. We say this is impossible. Again, we say this is impossible. Hold on. Uh, yeah. So there's actually four possibilities here. The fourth one is that each of their wills occur. And this is impossible because one wants to create, the other does not want to create. It results in a contradiction. And the other possibility is what's mentioned here. Number three, both the worlds are always in agreement. Now this implies a limitation. This is why this is also rejected. Number two is the only scenario which is possible. Number two. Okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, Qulu Allah ahad, Allah sabat, lam yalid, wa lam yulad, wa lam yakul lahu kufuan ahad. Say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is ahad, unique, absolute one, indivisible. Allah sabat, he is eternal, he is independent, he is self-subsistent, self-existent. Lam yalid, wa lam yulad, he neither begets nor was he begotten. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is self-sufficient in the, in the self-sustaining cause. Wa lam yakul lahu kufuan ahad. And nor is there anything or anyone similar, co-equal, equivalent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based on the Qur'an. Everything that we mentioned is in conformity with the Qur'an. Any questions? Yes, just want to clarify a bit more. <laughs> if you have some, we have affirmed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must have no beginning. But we did not speak about God having no end. MashaAllah. Um, uh, Brother Hamza, if something does not have a beginning, it means it cannot have an end. And I, I, and I will explain why this is the case. If something does not have a beginning, and I ask you the question, how long has it been there? Something exists with no beginning. And I ask you, how long has it existed? What is the answer? God having an Oh, yeah. So, so what is the answer, Brother Hamza? I'll write the answer. God has always existed. Forever, which means eternal. Anything which has no beginning is eternal. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Okay, inshallah. Any other questions? Mu'iyyakum, brother. What is the time? 8.35. We have two massive topics to cover. Two massive topics to cover. So inshallah, if there's no question, I'm going to move on. We now we speak about revelation. So what did we do? Let's think what we did. The summarization and the conclusion that we can make from this discussion 
is that theism, actually not, we have not proven theism yet. All we have proven is that there is a God. Essentially, that's what we've done. That there is God. Okay. Now, there are two options here. Um, the option number one, which is what you call deism. Does anyone know what deism is? Deism. Deism. I'll, I'll write it if you can't. Deism. And the other is called theism. So far, what we've done is that we have actually um, we have addressed atheism, and we have also addressed polytheism. So we've addressed um, atheism, affirming God but denying religion. Yes, correct. So Farha, uh, she mentioned that deism is essentially that a person who affirms God uh, but rejects any re any religion that is revealed. Yeah. So and also uh, Sister Najifa, she asks a question. Where they accept existence of God, but they think it is separate. Oh, okay, yes, sorry. And so she's defining deism. Yes, that is correct. So they accept the existence of God, but uh, God has no interaction, plays no in no interaction, no role, no message, no communication with the, with the creation, no scripture, no prophets. None of that exists within the de deistic worldview. And the second is theism. Agnostic. Um, agnostic is a different philosophy altogether. Agnosticism is the understanding. I mean, there's different kinds of ag agnosticism as well. I mean, there's hard and there's soft, or what you call radical uh, or strong agnosticism and weak or soft agnosticism. So strong agnosticism is basically saying we cannot know of anything and obviously there are absolute agnosticism and then there are specific agnosticism so agnostic is that we cannot know anything as we cannot attain acquire knowledge specific agnosticism is that we cannot know something relating to this specific matter specific hmm? and then there's also the hard version and the soft version so the soft version or the weak version will say, we do not know. But there is a possibility that we can know. It's just that so far, we do not know. If that makes sense. So one of them is making the statement, we cannot know. Which again, this point needs to be, this point needs to be proven. This point needs to be substantiated. Otherwise, it's a self-defeating, self-contradictory statement. Because you're saying we cannot know of anything. At the same time, you are certain about the statement itself. A lot to take in, but alhamdulillah. Yeah, there is a lot to take in. What Yaakov, inshallah, again, um, I, I mean, I definitely do admit that there is a lot of information to take in. So, um, I mean, yeah, so I mean, we'll just continue and if you guys do have questions you can ask so now we are addressing the dichotomy or the uh, uh, addressing the worldview of deism and theism how can we arrive at theism and then more particularly how can we arrive at islam as being the true religion inshallah now we speak about wahi or the topic of revelation now, within the books of theology, the topic of revelation, it actually comes under the topic of nubuwa. Nubuwa or risala, which is the topic or the subject matter pertaining to prophetology, pertaining to prophetology or prophethood. But we are making it separate for the sake of simplicity and for the sake of clarity. These, this is the content. Okay, I mean, I think this session there's going to be a lot of information. Um, there's going to be a lot of information. 
But what is the criteria? I mean, just read the title. What is the, the criteria to determine divine authorship? Let me explain what I'm saying. I mean, what is the criteria for us to know whether God has sent something to mankind, to humanity? How can we know? How can we identify? What is the criteria to determine whether God has sent down or revealed something to humanity or not? Okay. If the book in question, okay, so you come across the book, whether this book meets a certain criteria, then the belief of it being from the one who revealed it, in other words, God, is reasonable, justifiable, and sound if it meets a certain criteria. Okay, again, the criteria is stipulated based on rational principles. Anyone who says that Islam Islam is not a rational religion is mistaken. Islam in its usul, and keep this in mind, in its usul is based on rational principles. Yet the faru' which is the subsidiary, uh, the subsidiary jurisprudential or the Islamic law, this itself, it is not predicated on rational reasoning. Rather, it is based on ta'a or Islam. It is just based on submission and obedience. But the theological underpinnings of the religion themselves are based on rational proof and they're based on rational justification. This is very, very crucial to keep in mind. Okay. So what is the criteria? Number one, it must be miraculous in some way or another. What are we speaking about? Hmm? We are speaking about the book, the scripture. It must be miraculous in some way or another. For example, there must be something, there must be something about the scripture, whether in its structural composition, okay, which is the sentences of the book, or the content of the book that points to uh, that points to it being from God, that points to it being from the supernatural being, the personal supernatural being. Number two, it must not contradict the logical principles and the sound deductive syllogisms, which is the deductive proofs. It cannot go against this. Why? Because that which is based on deduction and sound, again sound, it has to be sound deductive syllogism. The conclusion themselves are certain. This is what you call ilm al yaqini. What are they called? Ilm al yaqini. Definitive certain knowledge. Now, it is impossible. In fact, it is a philosophical paradox and an absurdity that you have ilm al yaqini, which is a certain definitive knowledge, contradicting definitive certain knowledge coming from the divine, coming from Allah. And this is why we say that sound logical arguments will never contradict the Quran. Let me say that again. Sound logical deductive arguments will never contradict the Quran. Impossible. Because logic will give you ilm al-yaqini, yufid ilm al-yaqini, and the Quran will also give you the yufid ilm al-yaqini. It will also give you a certain definitive knowledge. So knowledge will never contradict knowledge. That's the point. So they must be in harmony. That is the reason. Number three, it cannot contradict the empirical reality in facts. For example, so I mentioned some example here. It cannot be said that water does not exist or that the moon, it is a star reflecting its own light. We know this is a false statement. We know that moon is not a star, okay? And moreover, the moon, it does not reflect its own light. Rather, it is a reflection of the light of the sun, which is a star. So anyone who makes these claims or these points or the statements, whatever book it is, it cannot be true. It cannot be true, why? Because it contradicts empirical reality, that which is factual, okay? Number four, 
it must not contradict the basic and correct concept of God as deduced by the rational mind. So everything that I've spoken to you about, everything so far that we have spoken, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, based on the rational proofs, this scripture, it cannot contradict it. And again, this is just a consequence of the second criterion. Someone has asked a question, I will answer them. What about the extrapolations the Salaf derived from the Quran, such as geocentricity or hellfire was underneath the ocean? Hellfire was underneath the ocean. Uh, Allahu A'lam, if hellfire being underneath the ocean was from the pole of the Salaf or not, and that, I mean, that requires tahqiq, the verification with respect to the geocentricity of the earth which is as in um and describing the earth being the center uh, in opposition to the heliocentric model um again this is what you call interpretation this is what you call interpretation and, and it is not based on the muhkam or the zawahir of the quran or the nas so again we have to be clear uh, what category of the quran are we speaking about and also what is the category of reality that we are speaking about we are not speaking about scientific theories but rather we are speaking about um, objective uh, empirical facts such as we know for sure we know for sure based on observation and the observation is not based on one person the observation is based on tawatur so it is based on a number of people seeing the same thing for example, the existence of water, okay, or you know, something such as the existence of tree. We know a tree exists, or that we know that uh, males and females exist. We know that animals exist. We know that the sun exists, or we know that the we know that the that the moon exists. Muhammad ayat align with intellect. Yes, that is correct. Whilst the mutashabihat ayat may not. That is correct. That is correct. Yes. Any time, brother. Uh, okay. Mm. Okay, inshallah. Yeah. So, and uh, number point number, we're up to number five. Some have also added the condition as well that the book must not call humanity to evil or immorality or injustices injustice sorry in other words the, the book itself it cannot contradict our intuitive moral conscience and the fetra understanding uh, but again there are only a few examples that will be included under this argument for example it cannot call humanity to genocide or to innocent killing. Okay. And then, but this point is disputed, but I've mentioned just so you know that some people have also added this condition that in order for something to be the book of Allah and based on divine, um, divine authorship or divine origin, it cannot contradict our, uh, our moral intuitive um, understanding our moral conscience okay but again we're talking about uh, the most clear apparent the most fundamental things such as killing innocent killing uh or you know mass murder genocide you know if a book tells you to you know it's allowed to do mass killing innocent killing genocide then as in the scholars have said you can reasonably conclude that such a text cannot be from god although it is possible Although it is possible, and theologically, and if you were to speak about it, it's possible. But uh, the, the question is whether um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would do such a thing or not. But it is possible. And this is why it's hard to say whether this condition um, is a, uh, it's a good condition to, to, to put forth because it is, it is disputed. Anyways, point number six. 
it must not contain an internal textual contra contradiction. This is critical. If the text itself clearly contradicts itself, then you know it cannot be from the divine. Now, putting, putting all of these conditions together, if you can find a book, a scripture, that is claimed to be the message of Allah, and if it meets the criteria, then you can come, you can come to that acceptance. If it does not meet that criteria, the sixth condition, when you put them together, if it does not meet, meet this criteria, then it cannot be from Allah. Does that make sense? This is the criteria of determination. If whether you want to know whether something is from Allah or not. I believe the argument of scripture, this is called the argument for scripture or from scripture, depending on how you want to say it. It is sound and it is a non-circular argument only if it meets the above conditions. Undoubtedly, the Quran, it meets the above conditions, the above criteria. Thus, it can be concluded that the Quran is scripture from a personal supernatural agent or supernatural being. In other words, the speaker of the Quran also reveals himself as Allah. So let the speaker of the Quran speak. Let the speaker of the Quran speak. And it's saying that this is a revelation from Allah. Tanzilun mir Rabbil Alameen. A revelation from the Lord of the worlds. Allah, the divine personal supernatural being. I will end it here. And I'll open up for Q&A. Because I think there's a lot of things to go through, but it is impossible. <laughs> you know, practically, not logically, but practically it's impossible to go through all of the other slides. Yeah, I and mean, there's more than 50 slides left, more than 50 slides left. So, I mean, it's impossible, I mean, practically, uh, highly improbable for me to go through all of them in a short amount of time. So I've opened it for Q&A. Anyone who wants to ask, they can ask. And inshallah, we can maybe continue at some other point, at some other time, we can continue. Is this miracle? Supporting the Quran, its literary excellence. Yes, that is correct, Brother Hamza. But it is not limited to the literary excellence of the Quran. There is more than six different uh, points that speaks about the miraculous nature. The miraculous nature or the in inimitability, the inimitability, the miraculousness of the Quran. There is more than six different arguments. Obviously, within the literary excellence, there is a, a whole list, a host of arguments that one can propose and one can present to support the literary excellence and the masterpiece of the Quran, both in its linguistics, in its structure, in its composition, in its content, etc. There are a few examples of fake surah composed by certain enemies of Islam. How do we refute them? Um, I mean, um, this requires uh, some detailed discussion, but from the angle, from the angle of of the literary structure, huh? from the angle of the literary structure, we say that such things that they conform to the known linguistical patterns of the Arabic language. So we say these things, which are proposed as competitors of the Quran or a similarity to the Quran to meet the challenge of the Quran, we say that these things, they, uh, they fall short of the challenge. Why do they fall short of the challenge? The reason is because they conform to the known Arabic linguistical literary structures and patterns of the Arabic language. Whereas in contradistinction to the Quran, the novelty and the miraculousness and the inimitability of the Quran is that it does not conform to any one of the known linguistical, literary structures or patterns of the, of the Arabic language. So from this aspect, the Quran is still unmet in its challenge, unrivaled in its challenge. Why? because it does not conform to what we know 
from the Arabic language in terms of its literary instruction composition, in terms of its eloquence and its structural composition. All of the other attempts that have been made, the fake surah uh, that have been made to be challenges of the Quran, all of them fall short because they can be categorized and classified into the Arabic language. And they fall short from the Quran in its meaning, in the ma'na, in the balagha, hmm? and also in its other, um, uh, in other linguistical, rhetorical devices, in its eloquence, in its conciseness, etc. So, but how do we go about the Quran and how they are still in the Quran? Destroyed all, all the other Quran. Did he keep one copy of each Qara'a? One second, let me just read that question again. But it is a, it is a different topic. It's a different topic. Uh, it comes under under the topic of Ulum al Quran. Um, but I'll just read through it again. How they are still okay. So the, the ten qara'at, these are just different, uh, different dialectical ways of pronouncing the Qur'an. Let me say that again. They're just different modalities, ways, dialectical ways of reciting, uh, of pronouncing the Qur'an. They are not different Qur'an. The mistake here is that they are not different Qur'an. It is not a different version of the Quran. It's one Quran. It's just a different way of recite of recital. When Uthman radiallahu anhu destroyed all of the other, no, he did not destroy all of the other Quran. And he, yeah, he burnt the other copies of the Quran, which were kept by the people. But what he did is that he standardized, he standardized the Quran and all of the qira, the qiraat, right? The qiraat could be recited from the one mushaf. Did he keep one copy of each qiraat? No. All of that could be recited from the one copy, from the one standardized copy that he made. There is a difference of opinion as to how many copies he made. Some say he made five master copies. Some say he made seven and some say he made eight. But it was one mushaf. Uh, and all of the different ways of recitation, the different modes of recitation could be contained within the one mushaf. For example, فَتَبَيَّنُوا and فَتَثَبَّتُوا فَتَبَيَّنُوا and فَتَثَبَّتُوا If I'm not mistaken, if I am wrong, I'll, I'll double check. Again, this is a different topic, so my memories perhaps not strong, um, but it's just the same word with different diacritical markers. So the Uthmani script, the Uthmani Mus'haf, when he uh, instructed the Sahaba to write the Quran, it was without any of the tashkeen and without any of the diacritical markers. So for example, you know, in, in the letter Ta, or the letter Ba or Tha, it was just written in, as one, um, as one, how can I say it? Let me see if I can grab a, um, a marker. Just give me one second now. Uh, how can I get the marker? Okay, here. I'll, I'll show you for demonstration. And it was only written like this. Okay, and then continuation with something else for something else. Okay, you could not know if, if it was a ba or a ta or a fa. The same thing with the sin. Sin, um, but it, it could be shin. So all of these ways, it was written without the markers. Uh, in in this is why it would accommodate. It accommodated the all the way also. And the point about there being 10 qara'at is also disputed. Some said seven and some said 10. But all of them could be just recited from the, 
from the Mus'haf of Uthman radiallahu an. That's in Surah Al-Hujurat. Yes, that is correct. Mm -hmm. And there's also a discussion of Ahraf and Qira'at. And, but again, that's a topic that we cannot go into. We can't. Like, that, that topic will just take 30 minutes explaining. The distinction of Ahraf and Qira'at, if there is a distinction. Um, yeah. But I mean, it, it's, a good, it's a good question. And, and sometimes it is raised, particularly from the Christian. The Christians will ask this and they'll say, look, you have different versions of the Quran. We correct the misconception by saying this is not different versions of the Quran, rather it is different modes of recitation of the same Quran. So I hope this clarified the misconception. We'll do a separate talk on Ulum Quran. Inshallah, yes, I think it will be very beneficial for students of knowledge, um, for there to be a dars or for there to be a program. Uh, on Ulum al-Qur'an, which speaks about the preservation of the Qur'an and authenticity of the Qur'an, and then it will also be speaking about the Ahruf and the Qira'at distinction, and Hadith as well, major topic, major topic. It's like dialectics, but exactly, so what Brother uh, Junaid mentioned, it is like dialectics. And it's, it, it does not even change the meaning as well. Now, some said that it does change the meaning, but if it does, it is only for uh, it's only for ziyada. Allahu A'lam. I mean, this is very technical. So, I mean, so anyone who is at this da'wah, um, anyone who's attended the workshop, please don't think that this is a requirement. You have to know. Uh, it is good if you do know, but it is not a farna'in knowledge. I've heard Samur Ahmad and some others stay away from the intelligent design argument for the existence of Allah. What is your stance on this? Very good question. Excellent question. Should we just stick with the Kalam contingency arguments? No. Right. In fact, I have a whole list of arguments, literally more than 15 different arguments with its different variations and formulations. Five of them is just on the design argument. Just on the design argument. Five. There's also something similar to the design argument. Uh, which is called the fine-tuning argument. Um, and again, that is a very strong argument. And I could have used the, I could have used the intelligent design argument. I could have used the fine-tuning argument. They are strong arguments. Um, so Bur Ahmad, the reason why he doesn't is because of some certain types of reservations that he has, you know, due to invoking biology and evolution when it comes to intelligent design. I mean, there is the possibility of the objections and the whole contention and back and forth. Um, that's why he tries to stay away from it. Uh, but um, it is, I mean, it is a very sound argument. The intelligent design argument is a very sound argument. Um, also, something that is stronger is the fine tuning argument. In the fine tuning argument, it has been written in multiple books, multiple literally books have been written upon the fine tuning argument. Um, that the universe itself has been extremely fine-tuned that it's just highly highly extremely Im like improbable like to such a uh, an absurd level to postulate that the universe could have come up by chance uh, without a deliberate without a deliberate a coordinated um willful volitional uh powerful agency behind the fine-tuning i mean it just does not add up it does not make sense once you've put all of the data together um, i mean there are so many uh, factors and so many influences you know, when it comes to the fine-tuning argument that make the universe so finely tuned that makes life permissible and makes life it permits life you know without one just one of these constants of factors without just one of them you know there would be no life on earth so, um, I mean, to get the fine tuning of the universe, um, it, it's literally, you know, to say to come, uh, for the universe to come by chance, you know, that's more of, a, of an absurd stance to take on than to say that um, a plane, a plane came by chance and formed itself by chance. 
I'm, if these are the odds that we are speaking about, literally. If someone's not going to believe that a, a jumbo jet plane can form by chance, by some random coincidences after millions and billions of years, but they still want to accept the formation of a jumbo jet plane with its functionality, that it makes no sense at all to accept the, that the universe, which is, again, more complex, more complex and sophisticated, it could come up by random chance. I mean, it makes no sense at all. It's counter, it's counter rational, counter productive, and counter intuitive. Yeah. But I mean, like, there are a lot of articles written about the fine tuning argument in support, evidence in support of the fine tuning argument. And even the physicists cannot deny the fine tuning argument. Even Stephen, Stephen Hawking. He does not deny the, the fine tuning of the the fine tuning of the universe, um, and um, again for him he he does believe in in the multiverse. Um, he suggests that the multiverse theory could be an explanation, but again it's um, it's just absurd to say the multiverse. So, I mean, uh, if there are any other questions, inshallah, you can ask. Uh, would you recommend, to, uh, uh, when you recommend a non-Muslim who wishes to learn more about Islam to go straight to the Quran? Yeah, of course, yeah, definitely. I mean, it depends what you mean by learning about Islam. What does the person want to learn? If the person wants to learn the message of Islam, yeah, definitely just read the Quran. The Quran is very clean. Honestly, the Quran, anyone who has read the Quran, the message of the Quran is clean. It is to accept Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as your Rabb and as your Ilah, your God, and to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to follow the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to believe in the prophets and messengers of Allah and to believe in the afterlife, in paradise and hell. I mean, the message is clean. If there's something else that the person wants to learn, then, you know, they might need to consult um, scholars or, or, or they might need to read something about Islam that makes you know, like an exposition, something which uh, makes a particular point about Islam clear or speaks about the ahkam or the rulings of Islam or something. I mean, it just depends on the question of inquiry of what thing the person wants to learn about. Would you recommend them to also refer extensively to tafsir while reading the Quran? Extend? I mean, yeah, why not? <laughs> why not? Um, it is all beneficial knowledge derived from the Quran and the tafsir themselves I mean they are reliable comment uh, reliable uh, explanations clarifications commentary of the Quran and sometimes you know the insights and the gems that you see in the tafsir and it, it's incredible honestly it's just it's remarkable so I mean in that case if the person has the time if the person has the capacity definitely why not read the Quran read the, the tafsir of the Quran and if that's going to suit their purpose of inquiry, yeah, definitely, why not? So, um, I mean, it's past time. It's definitely the past time now. So I'm going to have to, uh, inshallah, uh, let you guys go. But again, Barakallahu Fikum wa Jazakallahu wa Khairan wa Ahsanu al jaza for everyone's attendance and participation and contribution and for the attention as well. I hope I was, I was of some benefit and some help um, from the little that I know. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue uh, with, these, uh, with this series. And inshallah, it does become a very beneficial and helpful facilitating uh, series for the Muslims, inshallah. Jazakallah khair with Mustafa Amr. Really appreciate it for taking your time and um, providing a knowledge, giving a knowledge to us first years and second years who aim to benefit, inshallah. Um, we really appreciate it. And inshallah, we'll probably see you in the next few events as well. Later on with the um, with the MSA, inshallah, and a big thank you to the volunteers as well for listening. Um, 